it's a, it's a test balloon of sorts. If you find my voice somehow comforting, <laughs> and you can take it for an hour, then please show up for the screening of a wonderful documentary on Lotte Eisner. Unfortunately, when Get Gemünden and I did the subtitling and we did the text, we, we tested it out and it's just, it's gonna be too distracting if we run along the side. We basically would be running the image and then you'd have it. So instead, I'm gonna sit in the back and I'm going to do voiceover. And I apologize for this very imperfect solution, but I think that, and we have this and people can have, not that we will, it, it'll be a darkened room, but you can have that, we printed out, what, 20, 20 or so copies, 20, 30 copies. So you can have that for reference if you miss anything. But that's today at 5.30, and we're doing it in this room rather than over at the Visual Arts Center, as it says on the program. This way, it would just be easier. We're here. <laughs> For those people who show up there, I'm sorry, I don't know what to do. <laughs> they don't need to listen to me. Um, anyway, without further ado, Monica Castillo, it's all yours for the next panel. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, of course. Hi, everyone. I am not A.O. Scott. Um, <laughs> Monica Castillo. Um, unfortunately, Tony couldn't be here. And fortunately, uh, Gerd and Noah invited his neighbor and colleague to fill in for him um, to talk about his book, Better Living Through Criticism, um, which is a collection of essays and self-reflective interviews about the profession and goes into and covers all kinds of topics, some, many of which we've covered so far in this conference. Um, but now I want to introduce our panel over here. Um, we have Christina Nord, who's a recovering critic, now, <laughs> now Director of uh, Cultural Programming for Southwest Europe at the Goethe Institute. Uh, Stefan Grissman, uh, who's a current film critic, whose writings can be found in Profil, uh, Die Presse, and Film Comment, among many, many others. And then we have uh, Johannes von Moltke, who is a chair and professor over at the University of Michigan. Uh, specializing in film and German cultural history, and has had works published in Criticism, A New German Critique, and um, Screen, among many others. So I wanted to start off with my favorite chapter in uh, Tony's book, which is uh, How to Be Wrong. Uh, if you haven't read the book, I highly recommend it. But um, I just want to go over what he has to say about how critics can be wrong. Let's recapitulate and expand our register of critical errors. There are so many ways to go wrong. You can overvalue the grand achievements of the past and under, underrate the still wet, still raw efforts of the present. Or you can turn your face bravely towards the future and neglect the glories that lie behind you. You can idolatry, um, idolatry <laughs> worship the exquisite shape and tone of the thing itself or crack it open to shift through what is inside. You can celebrate artifice, the brilliant ways the thing can seem to know just what it is, or embrace authenticity, the mute sublimity of a thing just being itself. You can regard it with cool, self-contained skepticism, or embrace it with heedless ardor. You can walk carefully in the footsteps of moderation and responsibility, staying within a few standard deviations of conventional wisdom, or you can wave the bright flag of opposition. You can be earnest or flippant, plain-spoken or baroque blunt or coy, dilettante or geek. You can follow the precepts of theory or just go on your nerve. You can labor to be consistent or blithely, capriciously uh, contradict yourself. And now I wanna ask the panel, have you ever been wrong? And if so, <laughs> how did you go about either addressing it or dealing with it in what form or way or another? Um, well. Uh, of course, um, we. I, I guess. I mean, I, I'm speaking for myself. I was wrong so many times. It's amazing, uh, <laughs> and I uh, also uh, reevaluate or have to reevaluate all my judgments all the time, really, because it's so. Um, I, I, what I found out in, in you know doing this this job for a few decades is, of course, that. It de it's dependent on so many things, like uh, like you know just the daily condition that you're in, for example. Um, that doesn't mean, of course, that that it's it's totally random what you say about a film, uh, but it's it's still um, dependent on on many many things like uh, like yeah like the conditions that you're in in, in, in that specific day, like uh, the deadlines, the, the deadlines for example, <laughs> yeah, but also the the, the state of knowledge uh, about a certain film. You know, there are very very. 
um, demanding films also thematically that that uh, that you would have to maybe ideally uh, know a lot beforehand and if you don't um, you are liable to make mistakes but I I think that's not a very interesting um, um, aspect of, of, of the profession of a film critic because why shouldn't film critics be wrong I mean this it's 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 totally normal that you uh, that you on the one hand, try your best, but still uh, cannot be perfect in any in any respect of, or any sense of the word. And it's, I mean, uh, criticism is is so important because it makes um, it takes art and it, it, it creates art history in a way. All the critics together, of course, not one specific uh, critic. Um, but you are also constantly wrong. Uh, about this art history, because you are you are living in the moment, you are uh, judging or uh, commenting or mediating in the moment, and of course you you cannot know everything. This, for now. So what you're saying is, film critics are human. Sure. Okay, good. <laughs> Just checking, yeah. uh, Christina. Um, yeah, sure. I've been wrong, um, but I'd also like to stress the fact that it's a learning process. So. Um, you're wrong, you realize that you're wrong, and then hopefully you learn how to make it better the next time. And for me, um, it was uh, one experience I made, which was crucial in that sense, was when I went to Cannes for the first time. We talked about Cannes yesterday and how stressful it can be to be there. And when I went there the first time, I wasn't really aware of the fact that the fact that it's stressful might influence my way of perceiving films. Um, so I came to quite a lot of harsh, harsh judgments um, when I was there for the first time. And when I reread the reviews, um, the festival reports I, I, I wrote in that circumstances, I was a little bit surprised about this harshness and this rigidity. And I later became aware of the fact that a lot of it had to do with the working conditions I was facing there, with, uh, with uh, seeing four or five films a day, having to write one piece each day, having a very tight deadline, and being under pressure. Um, and um, I think that uh, initiated a learning process which led to, um, to not, or trying not to be judgmental in festival situations, unless I was really certain of what I had seen. So when I was in doubt about a film, I would either not write about it, I would uh, abstain from judgment and sort of like go more for description of the film, um, instead of um, trying to formulate um, a judgment like that. And in general, I think festival conditions are um, tough working conditions. And um, I find it hard to, um, or I found it hard to, uh, to, to, to come to, let's say, something like a definite position towards a film. I think a position towards a film is something which is also developed, developed um, sometimes over the course of years, uh, and it can change. Um, so yeah, that is, that is sort of like my learning experience and where I was wrong, um, I think. I was particularly particularly wrong wrong when I wrote about Spider by Cronenberg um, for the first time, and I s saw it again. And I was like, Ah, Christina, what have I done back then? And can, but yeah, learning Did you process. Like it the first time? No, I didn't oh. like it at all. And when I saw it again, I liked it. Yeah. Was it at that festival? That con festival? Yes, it was the. It was two thousand two. Mm -hmm. mm. Just to, just to follow up what I just said before, it, it, the question also is, of course, it, can there be a right in film criticism? I mean, mm -hmm. what, what's right? Uh, it's, also, it's always an opinion. It's always uh, a learned opinion and an, and an uh, ideally a balanced opinion, but it's, not, it's never right or wrong. It's, yeah. not, it's actually not the, the point but of a criticism. It's, it's, maybe it's more like um, that uh, you're wrong yourself in exactly. a way. Yeah. Um, so I came to a conclusion about a film which was premature and um, and it had to do with the, with the circumstances I was working in. Um, whereas later I saw the film again and I could see a lot of things in the film I couldn't see when I was under the strained conditions of Cannes. And um, so it's more about like true, being true to yourself yeah. instead of being right or wrong. 
have anything to add? Well, as we all know, academics are not human. <laughs> <laughs> never wrong. <laughs> you can't be because of peer review. It makes sure that you're never wrong. Um, no, but I'm thinking more of what I think Kerry was saying about the, diff the distinctions. I mean, we've been thinking, all, all of us have been thinking about it to some degree, about the distinctions between criticism and, 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 and scholarship. And uh, even though the object is the same, the, the procedures, the protocols, and the deadlines are very different. Um, uh, we all know that ac academia has the most non-deadline deadlines that you can imagine. Um, uh, so you, it's a different kind of reasoning, but but I think you know the, the process that you're both describing is the one that I think we all share, right? You 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 encounter something, you 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 deal with it, you react to it, and then upon reflection, you might change. And uh, it's just as academics, you 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 haven't put it out there yet by the time you've changed. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the main thing separating scholars from critics. I don't, I don't know. I, 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 won't, <laughs> I won't commit to that. <laughs> you did say in an earlier panel that um, we would talk a little bit more about that difference between critics and, or film criticism, sorry, and film theory. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with the class? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think Tony's book is, a, is, a, is actually a good, uh, good starting point for that discussion because, on, on, I mean, or... or to pick up on on Rick's point that you know when when you get tired of doing criticism you write theory I mean in a way it does <clears throat> you know he he does I'm sorry was it was it Matthias um, I don't want to miss 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 uh, attribute I was wrong um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, I, I mean, it's clearly a, a critic who's been working hard in the trenches for a long time, deciding that it's time to write a book. I know he's, he also teaches at, um, at Wesleyan. Um, and that kind of step back produces a, a different kind of discourse, I think, um, uh, and a different kind of set of pressures that you can see in the book that, it, that he reflects on to a great degree of having to bring in Kant and Burke and the you know, whole set of references. If, for those of you who haven't read the book, if, if and when you uh, choose to do so, you'll be surprised at how little film is in this book. I mean, that's one of the things that a lot of people remarked on. And that, um, uh, besides the Avengers at the beginning and Ratatouille at the end, there's not a whole lot of uh, reflection on movies because it's a reflection on criticism as such. The book is also um, testifying to the... To the, to the uh, to what we are talking about here, actually, the, the crisis of, of criticism in a way, mm -hmm. um, because I think it's 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 a it's a work that that really is tiptoeing around a foreign object called critical thinking, mm -hmm. and it's 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 constantly and relentlessly encircling that object, trying to describe every mini every every you know minuscule detail of that object and is in a way, and, and I don't know, this maybe even despairingly, not getting close to that object. That, that's, that would be one of my um, um, yeah, criticisms of the book, uh, that, that you, it, it actually shows that criticism is, is a very complicated object to theorize. And, and even for someone who knows so much and who writes so well, it has to be said, uh, Tony writes really good. Um, he still is not in a position, in my in my mind, to 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 really get to to anything like uh, the beauty and the truth of what he aspires to be. You know, um, it's in a way uh, the, the the whole the whole work is is even marred by dialectic thinking. It's it's an it's an act of unleashed dialecticism. I think he he tries to really. Um, Every every argument he gives, uh, he tries to to have every you know he tries to uh, view it from every angle, from every from every side. It's always he understands all positions, all aspects, and that's of course also um, it's a nice and sympathetic feature to 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 be able to understand all aspects. But still, you have to, and I think it's a it's a crucial um, thing for for a critic to have. You have to be partisan in a way. And he is not a partisan. He is in this book for 268 pages. He is not partisan. <laughs> he is un trying to understand all the aspects, po really possibly all aspects that he can gather from all the reference, from all the cultural references that he takes to, to, to kind of get a grasp of what this is, criticism. Mm. And what he, he ends up 
I think I, I think really the, the last line of the book before the last um, dialogue is um, let me let me check it before I quote it <laughs> before I quote it wrongly. We would I hate think, for you to yeah. be wrong. <laughs> Uh, I think the last line is, we have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit telling also, that because this book is really, it leaves you clueless, in a way, you know? <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, while, while I was reading it, I really wished for a moment in which he would assume a certain position, yeah. in yeah. which yeah. he would um, embrace criticism as a great endeavor, as uh, something wonderful and, and enriching and, 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 and mind-blowing and knowledge, pro, pro, um, something which produces knowledge, and he does not. And um, for me, it was a little bit hard um, to, to find my way through the book because I was wishing so much for that moment, and it would not appear. Um, mm. I mean, then there maybe there is this ratatouille, um, <laughs> but that is more like... Uh, the opposite of criticism. It's the Proustian moment of recognizing the ratatouille your mother cooked for you um, <laughs> and having that uh, special satisf satisfaction. That About the character it. Anton Ego, who's yeah, the yeah, yeah. food critic yeah, yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, I mean, of course, going to the movies has these kind of m m moments f in store for you, and that is one of the beauties of cinema. But um, um, when it comes to criticism, I think my expectations were um, a little bit different. Um, yeah, as I said, I was hoping for that moment, and it does not, uh, it does not materialize. You, you seem like you have I, an I answer. I want to say something that Gat wants to get in on the conversation. No, I just have a general question. I mean, the title is Better Living Through Criticism, <laughs> which sort of, I mean, if you, if you just see Better Living, you expect, you know, change your diet or exercise, <laughs> yeah. or, you know, talk more to your family members. Uh, but there, there's a certain promise in the title. Well. And even though if the book does, I mean, does the book deliver on that? promise in your in your opinion. I mean you've already noticed you have to sort of critique certain points of it, but does it still show us why criticism enrich, enriches our lives and makes us better humans or um, I don't know exactly regarding the title. Um, I had the feeling that it's both ironic and not ironic. It's both, and that's sort of like the whole drama of the book. Um, it's yeah, post ironic. Thank you for that. It's really post ironic, and maybe that's um, that's uh, that's that's the my, my uh, that describes my problem. I I have I had reading the book that uh, it's always both things at one time, and in a way I think uh, you cannot have both. Um, you cannot have sort of like this kind of uh, giving advice literature um, association, and then at the si same time the, the uh, converting it into something ironic, um, yeah. I still want to say something in defense of the book, yeah, but Jim sure. wants to say something too. I just want to say that, and I'll, I'll just back up. Uh, to me, the title is totally, totally literal. I mean, I defy anybody here to think of a better day. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. He, he actually gets to that uh, at the very end. Um, I'm not going to find that quickly enough. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, uh, um, for the sake of, no, uh, but also because I believe it, I, I'm going to push back uh, against um, a little bit of this and say that I think he does deliver a certain, um, uh, a, a certain principled stance on, on criticism. And uh, I, would, I would disagree with the fact that it's dialectical, uh, although I strongly agree with the fact that it always wants to have it both ways. But dialectics is not about having it both ways. So the, the main, the main uh, uh, um, clause, uh, its favorite idiom, is not either or, uh, but both and or but also. That's what always happens. It's but also. And it's, 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 I, I get it. It's, it's, it's almost aggravating at some point that you can always have both sides. But it's not dialectical. And what I think actually it is, is um, it's a principled uh, um, position in favor of a link between criticism, living, life, and experience. And um, I, think th I think that's what he's after. And I, 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 maybe, maybe in the book, the way it was published, it doesn't come out entirely. But um, I, I, I joined this panel late uh, at the last minute, so last minute that I actually forgot my copy of the book. So I went to the bookstore and bought 
the paperback version, which lo and behold, has another chapter. <laughs> and the, the, the chapter is called, afterward, a, a reply to my critics. One more dialogue, <laughs> which is, which is I, I mean, I've just glanced at it. It's, it's a tour de force in the sense that he, he got some serious criticism, especially from Leon Wieseltier, and um, he integrates it, ingests it, gives it to, uh, to a character that he invents. I mean, my hat's off to him for writing these, this dialogue. I don't think that's easy. It's, it's a cop-out on some level, but it's also, this, this, some of those dialogue passages are <laughs> what she said. <laughs> You've touched on something pretty, pretty <laughs> fundamental. Um, but also. But also. Um, so that is, I think that is one of the reasons, I, the, the, one of the parts of the book that, that, that I do like in the sense that it's certainly about giving positions their due. Uh, what, I, what I essentially want to say is that he, he, the principal position is that uh, criticism in its essence, and this is in the last few pages, is a conversation, a passionate, rational argument about a shared experience. And then he actually goes so far as to say Emerson and uh, Dewey are his guides in this. And suddenly you think, oh, I get it. It does make sense. There's a kind of pragmatism of criticism, but it's also a commitment. It's a, it's a, it's a deeply felt commitment of being a critic first, uh, like, like you were saying, being the critic first and the feminist second, being the critic first and then the film lover second. Um, uh, so he's not a film lover. He's not a cinephile. Uh, okay, uh, can, we, can we call him a film buff? <laughs> not even. All right. Well, we have to talk about that maybe. I'll stop here. <laughs> I get the I get the sense that the audience yeah. <laughs> has something to say. Um, so one at a time, <laughs> and I'm going to try and keep up with the mic. Um, I'll go in order. So okay. I'll be fast. Um, so I just want to I'm going to do the horrible thing of I've read most of it, but I haven't read all of it. So mm -hmm. just that's my confession. But one thing I really liked, um, and another. It's, it's both and, but also, um, but uh, rather than a division, finding a way to describe art as a form of criticism, and criticism as a form of art, and at least in universities and other places, what constitutes creative work and what constitutes critical work always seem to be a world apart. And I like that criticism is doing, criticism is creative, and I even, I mean, I feel like the, my favorite critics, it's so, they open up a world to me. And I, I will watch a film because this world has become available to me through this voice, and that it's this experience that is then supplemented by the film. Um, and I feel like he taps into the notion that criticism is itself a creative and generous as well as generative proposition. So I'll just put that out there as, it's nice to read that. <laughs> It could be. I mean, uh, you know, when when we when I first read this this book and, and I talked it over with Christina, uh, and we both agreed that it's it's so strange that uh, that actually we're the target audience of this, right? I mean, he describes our profession. He he really taps into exactly what I what I'm doing, what I love to do, and and what my interests are. And it, in a strange way, he he leaves us a little bit cold, you know. And this could also be uh, also be attributable to to the fact that maybe. Maybe I'm not the target audience at all because it, it, to me it seems so so obvious to say to state something like a, a, a good crit or great criticism can be an, a form of art and, and art is a form of criticism. Maybe that's much less uh, obvious than I think it is. You know, if, and also I mean he 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 overemphasizes from from my taste uh, things like. Um, Open-mindedness, you know, he celebrates open-mindedness. Who doesn't, right? I mean, and and also, uh, you know, he's against anti-intellectualism, and he tries this in a very journalistic way and very. I mean, if, you know, it's it's all fine, uh, but the, the thing is, it underwhelms me on a on a on a deep level and on on you know over all those pages uh, actually. Yeah. And but I, you don't live in the U.S. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, and when it comes to pragmatism. Um, I often tend to have a very pragmatic approach towards things, and I think as a writing strategy, if I wanted to be very, very, very pragmatic, um, I would have put sort of like the, what you mentioned, mentioned the, 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 the notion of criticism he finally develops on page 280. 
I would have put it in the very beginning and celebrated it a little bit um, to make sure what, what we are talking about. And then sort of like, uh, so like in order to, to, to grasp the attention of the reader, to get the attention of the reader and to make the reader understand where my sympathies are. And he does not. And for instance, what you said, I th yeah, sure, it's, it, it's beautiful. There are a lot of beautiful remarks and observations in, in the book. But then comes the but also. And on the one hand, he describes um, the um, criticism as an art form. But he also has um, paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs on um, the old perception of the critic being a parasite. And he's very elaborate on that and um, sort of like having this relationship to the artwork that criticism is like um, in a parasite uh, relationship to the, to the artwork. And um, yeah, of course, you can say that and then you can have the, the other position. But in a way, um, if you really want to convince people, um, I think it's easier if you start by saying, here, here we are, that's the beauty, that's the good thing. Um, yeah, and now you know where I stand and what I think. So he and buried the lead is what you're saying. Yeah, sort of. And okay. I, find, <laughs> I, I find that very unpragmatic in a way. Interesting. I'm in a weird position now where I have to defend this book I haven't read, but um, it, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, well, um, I, I, I think something to what Johannes was just saying about the American audience, and I think that Scott's very interesting because he has uh, essentially uh, staked out a place for himself where in the minds of most American newspaper readers and to the people who go to aggregate sites, his name is now synonymous with film analysis, which means that it's synonymous with film. Uh, even to people who don't seek out his criticism, they know that he's the guy telling you not to see the Avengers because <laughs> that's, the, that's the headline that makes news. So I think that there is something to the fact that he has to or thinks maybe he had to bring his usual readership, uh, who at this point he's used to having either a you know, very loving or very hateful relationship with and kind of taking them through what it is to be him and to slowly arrive at that, at that thing and not up front, uh, uh, defend himself, but rather to kind of bring people uh, along there, um, because I think maybe n knowing his reputation, if he were to say it up front to the U.S. readership, that might be an invitation to close the book and put it down, um, or maybe I'm I don't know, but, but yeah. I, I would I would uh, I think that's a that's a very perceptive comment for not having read the book that. Uh, <laughs> 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 That, the fact that um, I, th I, I agree that uh, I hadn't thought of it that way, but that his audience maybe really is not uh, you or you or I, but it's, it's the people he's writing for and to and talking to every day um, who presumably are telling him your, your Paris, your, you know, all you do is write about things that other people did. So, yeah. Doesn't he, I, I hope you read the first chapter. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Because the yeah. very first yeah. rhetorical gambit yeah. is to get in a fake fight, imaginary fight with Samuel L. Jackson, who said, who cares about critics and what they think? Oh, Everyone loves the Avengers, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you're starting off from the point of trying to convince you know, someone who's trolling <laughs> you on Twitter, <laughs> essentially who started the movie, yeah. then you've got a way to go to build up yeah. to yeah. Kant and Angela you know, Rosen. But actually, it's, uh, it's, it's oh, sorry. It's, I think it's actually the, the start is, is quite entertaining, of course, and, and this this infight with Samuel L. Jackson is of course nice to read, and, and but it's it's actually the wrong lead because it's it the book turns into something else entirely. I mean, there's the 200 pages actually of of um, of, of literary history and and you know very 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 slow uh, you know. Uh, uncovering of, of 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 what Oscar Wilde would say, of what you know T. S. Eliot would say. It's a lot of literary history in there, and it's it's it feels a, a lot like an elementary class on literary history in in many ways. Like um, he, it's, uh, I don't mean to say that 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 he doesn't doesn't know anything. When I say it's he's underwhelming, I don't mean to say that 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 there are not many many things in there that I wouldn't have known and which I could learn and, and glean from this book, but. Um, it's it's underwhelming in its argument and not in not in the not in the you know the details of its content. That's what I'm trying to say. 
I have also not read the book, uh, <laughs> nor do I know uh, Tony Scott very well. But what, if I may, what comes, what what arises from the conversation so far, is, and I was I was is is a very deep difference between a still existing uh, European notion of criticism, historical, and the product or commodity that criticism, a middle class commodity, you could say that criticism that is often understood when we when the term criticism is mentioned in a, in an anglo american context as far as my experience uh, tells me I, I was reminded of a of an anthology that tony case and others published in berkeley recently the promise of cinema and this is a uh, it's called the promise of cinema and it deals with german language early film criticism early film theory and uh, i thought there is also a promise of criticism, at least the way a German or European understanding of the term Kritik, Kritik der reinen Vernunft. Kritik is at the basis of the possibility this, that societies can change, as far as I always understood it, it as far as I was brought up. Then you, you are also being brought up at, at a university in the German language countries with Kritische Theorie, which is a, a rich tradition of philosophical thought with aesthetic criticism represented uh, by names like Adorno, Horkheimer, Benjamin, critical theory. So critique has a ring and a glamour or, or a, a promise that goes way beyond any journalistic genre or, or product or commodity. Critique is at the basis of how a person understands him or herself in relation to society. And the person who chooses to become a critic, even if he does so like I did, by founding a, 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 a small magazine, at a, at a film buffy or geeky type of starting in the, in, the, in the profession by founding a film magazine with five others also in their early 20s. Um, nevertheless, you are, you are energized by that understanding of critique. That even if you pick exploitation movies or art films or avant-garde films or Hollywood films as the subject of your critique, something will work through that, that and I know this is in, it's preposterous to say it, but in doing so, you will engage with culture in a way that will lead at some point, if there are enough others like you, to a changed relation to the cultural object, to cultural hierarchies, to power structures in culture and beyond culture. So when at least I understand Christina's and Stefan's criticisms of the book that I don't know <laughs> as coming as coming from the same background as my own understanding of what crit of what the promise of critique can be. Whereas from everything I've glanced about uh, Tony Scott's book, it, it's probably more in the tradition of a, and that's where Jim's uh, brief comment comes in really well. I think better living. Um, and I, I, I'm sorry, that, I mean, I, I don't want to, since I, who am I to say this, but it, it, it appears to me as if there was a, the definition of a class uh, uh, hidden in this title. Better living meaning, because Jim, you could say better living only if you're a full-time hired critic at the prestigious paper. Yeah. Not, not better living for the 97% of freelancers and of online critics and... Yeah. <laughs> but between between John between John Simon between John Simon 50 years ago and and AO Scott today there is a certain uh, class image that I also associate with the with the self definition of, of of calling oneself and being a critic you create a product where there is a certain readership as long as this class exists there will be this readership which means that my income will be safe uh, and those unspoken or 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 maybe out I don't know at the book so maybe he does discuss that but I I would fear that even though he tries to look at everything, as Stefan has described it, from every perceivable angle, he may not look at the problem from the angle of his own position in a certain class and mm -hmm. from his own mm -hmm. position as a producer of, of uh, well-fitting commodities for a specific market and a specific class. And if that 
in, intrudes in his definitions of criticism without being reflected, it may be part of the problem that my two German Austrian colleagues may feel or see in, in the book and others may, may see less, I don't know. Can I at this point add a little bit textual basis to our discussion? <laughs> Since we're all talking about a, a, a book after all. Um, in, in, uh, in the aforementioned last, last afterward, he um, writes, a few critics, some but not all of them younger than I am, may have looked forward to, or looked forward to attacking, a more polished account of my professional life, or a more forthright embrace of the prerogatives and perks of my day job. Some readers may have been nonplussed by my apparent lack of interest in such things, and smelled some bad faith in my disinclination to write explicitly from the position of a New York Times critic. My modesty could only be false, and my optimism can only be forced given the prestige of my institutional connections and the abysmal state of the trade in general. It's easy for me to promise better living when my living is easy. So he, he, th this is the nature of this book at this point, is that it's a hall of mirrors. Um, it, it's already meta when you read the first, the hardcover, and when you read this one, it's meta-meta. So smart, because now he's making us buy two books. <laughs> I want to get back to this question about uh, to what degree a film critic can be a cinephile, because I think um, there's a way with you look at, if you look at Tony Scott, he's always sort of been you know, had, had a team member. You know, Elvis Mitchell was the cinephile. He was, let us say, not that cinephile. Manola Dargis, who I think is a cinephile, but a very passionate. I mean, she loves the film she loves, she truly loves, and when she's displeased, displeased dismayed, um, that becomes equally apparent. I mean, you know, and love isn't, let us say, blind, and she makes that kind of clear. Um, I, I, I want to bring in another book to the discussion, which is, I think, for, for my money, probably the best book written in the English language, uh, um, best critique of film criticism. And that's uh, David Bordwell's book, The Rhapsodes, which is about, you know, about film critics of the 40s, American film critics of the 40s, Otis Ferguson, James Aggie, Manny Farber, and um, uh, Parker Tyler. Now, you know, I think many people, I mean, Kara, you're a big fan of Manny Farber. Many people hold up Manny Farber as, as, as really, you know, the master film critic in, in the English, in, in, in America, in any event. I mean, it's, it's, it's arguable, but I, I think a case can be made. Jim's made similar kinds of cases um, for that. And I think, you know, we talk about Paulette's, but I think Farber has, has, has really left indelible tracks, I think, in the way one writes about film in America. But he is certainly not a cinephile. And, and he is someone, though, who is, you know, such a master you know, in the way he uses language like jazz in a number of ways. And there, it's, it's, you can read a piece by him and really not know what he thinks about the film other than he's ambivalent. And, and that the film has sort of served as a point of departure for a, you know, a, a series of, of really virtuoso sort of phrases and, and, and ruminations. And I, I think that that... Uh, um, the great thing about the Bordwell book is, um, as a critic, Bordwell rises to the occasion and was, is able to mimic and, and, and in a number of ways not only emulate the way people are writing, but use that language um, in his own right to somehow be the equal of these really Im uh, formidable people that he's writing about. But I, I, I guess that, that larger question of you know, to what degree, especially people writing for daily newspapers, can be cinephiles is it, it, one that really might might deserve further exploration. Well, you can be ambivalent and still be a cinephile, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and many Faber, I think he, to, to me he's a quintessential cinephile, uh, even though he's written so little. Uh, actually, I mean it's it's not it's not a big body of work, of, or not to my knowledge. And he was also a painter, of course. I mean he's. Uh, he had another job as well. He was also passionate about uh, producing art, uh, apart from film criticism that he uh, did as art as well, of course. But yeah, I think Jim wants to add something. Yes, uh, I also I did want to add. I'm kind of curious, Justin, like your definition of a cinephile. Maybe that's more of a you know self-imposed title. Um, like, how does one determine that? Because I know you know until someone tells me like who writes about film that they are not a film critic, 
then I would assume then you are writing about films, you are reviewing films, you are therefore a film critic. Um, I'm also kind of curious, just like how, like that sort of definition, like so-and-so is a cinephile, but that person's not, because I thought of um, Tony's review of Moonlight, which was, you know, very effusive, very, he was just bowled over by this movie, and I felt like he really loved this movie. Um, and I felt that in his piece. But. Well, you know, I mean, I had a talk with Tony. Uh, Tony Scott came um, to my camp, home campus, and, and we had a chat about, you know, uh, about Manny Farber and about cinephilia. And he said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not a cinephile. He said, um, and for him to be a cinephile is to be an, would be to be an advocate, right? And um, in, a, in a sense, to be a critic for him is not necessarily to uh, embrace altogether the objects of, of, of his activity. I mean, that, that was his understanding. I mean, I, I'm, you're correct that there are altogether uh, there are different understandings of what cinephilia entails. Is 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 the cinephile this kind of textual poacher who's constantly on the lookout for privileged moments, where in a sense uh, you love film because it, it gives rise to such kinds of reveries? That's the Michel Altain kind of cinephilia, I think. Um, are you are you one of these uh, you know classical cinephiles along the lines of the the, the, of the people who embrace the politique des auteurs, um, who in a sense privilege certain kinds of films, but do so in a way, and Andrew Serres is like that as well, that has a pantheon and has, you know, a purgatory, you know, in terms of, let us say, creative possibility. I mean, and again, it, 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 cinephilia is not blind, and cinephilia does somehow have mixed feelings as well. I think it is a tricky term, no doubt, and I think probably the best answer I could give you to the question is, I think cinephilia has a long history, and I think we tend to somehow seem to think it starts with 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 the Nouvelle Vague generation. It doesn't. It has a history that goes back at least to the twenties, um, in the cine clubs already in France, um, in the the notion of the kino noir in Germany. Um, and and I think we we need to historicize how we think of cinephilia. And in a sense, that in only in that way could you come up. I think with with a, a good understanding of it that is somehow historically differentiated. Thank you. Uh, well, my head is spinning because, you know, or exploding because there are just so many things to talk about here. I mean, first, I just want to say that by beginning with Samuel Jackson's complaint, I mean, Tony is amplifying something that every film critic who has ever lived has heard. It's like, who gives you, who the, you know, who are you? Who gives you the right to say that? And my response internally is, uh, hey, it's America, I can have an opinion, anybody can have an opinion. And then if they're smart, they would say, well, why is your opinion better than, okay. And I, we'll leave it at, at that point, which, you know, and then I, I wanna talk about the, the class aspect here, which, which uh, uh, Alex introduced. And I think that it's useful to relocate film criticism <coughs> in America in the world of journalism. Now, I was, fascinated to hear that Bela Balaj wrote for newspapers. I mean, that was really interesting to me. And I love the fact that Krakauer was a, was, was a newspaper man. And, you know, I don't really, I'm not conversant with the history of journalism in Europe, except the, uh, the notion of the fourth estate. But I can say that, that in America, there is a bohemian aspect to, to journalism. You're somebody outside of polite society. And if we think of the major film critics in American history, all the people who you mentioned in Boardwell's books have bohemian backgrounds. And none of them set out to be film critics. You know, they fell into it. And, you know, I'm not comparing myself to them, but that's true for me too. I didn't say I, I want to grow up and be a film critic. I found this gig. I said, oh, I can get paid for doing this? Amazing. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> and, and that, I think, is, is, is an aspect I, you know, I mean, the, the issue of cinephilia, if Tony's not some kind of cinephilia, his life must be torture. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, I, I say this, and not as an excuse. I, I could never do his job. I could never look at those movies day after day after day. I mean, I was very privileged at The Voice to be able to pick and choose what I wanted to write about. You know, otherwise, I would have burnt out. I mean, I couldn't have done it. So he must be, I mean, I don't know exactly how you define cinephilia, but, 
you know, I think it's, I, I, I don't think he's a masochist. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, there, there must be something, something there. But in any case, to come back to the larger point, I think that, and, and maybe I direct this to the, to the film uh, critics on, on the panel. You know, if somebody, when somebody says that to you, you know, what gives you, how do you have this opinion? What gives you the right, you know? Or, or they say, well, why should I listen to you? What, what is it, you know, that makes your opinion so special? What do you say? Can I add some more textual evidence? <laughs> <laughs> so this is just quoting Jackson. If you say something that's fucked up about a piece of bullshit pop culture that really is good, The Avengers is fucking good movie. Joss Whedon did an awesome job. If you don't get it, then just say, I don't get it. <laughs> Any others? Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, it was always, it wasn't too difficult to answer to the question you, um, you mentioned. Um, it's my professional life. I'm doing it like not 24 hours a day, but uh, 16 hours a day, uh, maybe more. Um, and I've been doing it for a long while. And that means that I'm sort of like, uh, I'm privileged to have access to more information than most of the people. And I'm trying to share this kind of expertise and knowledge. And that's what I do. And um, the fact that I have this kind of expertise and knowledge has a lot to do with uh, with my character, with myself, with my interest, with my enthusiasm for certain things. Um, but it's there, and I can't, in a way, neglect it. Um, it's there. I can't deny it. And um, I'm also in the position, or I was when I used to work as a film critic, to be able to write about this um, state I was in. Um, and... I was able to share it, and I had the feeling that people wanted to read it, um, and people did want to read it. So that's basically the answer to the question. Um, I am in the fortunate position to have the expertise, to have a certain expertise. That is, of course, not uh, the only take you can have on... Uh, of course, there are other perspectives. There are people with the same expertise who come to different kind of conclusions. Of course, they do. But um, yeah, I'm in this privileged position and I like to share it. And there are people who are interested. Well, I don't think it's a big achievement to write film reviews per se. I mean, it's, it's like, it reminds me of the discussion, how is this art? Anybody can do this. Of course, anybody can do it, but, but please do it. I mean, if you're, if you're so good, why don't you do it? And this is, of course, like the, the, the only way how, how, how to react to somebody who say a black square, anybody can do that. Okay. Uh, and you can, you can say the same about uh, film uh, reviews, of course, everybody can can be a film critic, but the question is: Is it good or bad, or is it is it valid or not? Good or bad is maybe the wrong category, but is it is it is it valid to anyone? If it's not, it it will get you know uh, devoured by the market anyway, or by you know you won't get another assignment if if you're not good enough. And and so it's like I said, it's not an achievement to be a film critic, but it's 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 a hard task to, to, to go on writing and, and, and creating some sort of audience, even if that's very small, uh, that, that enjoys it or finds it um, enriching. I don't know that Samuel uh, Jackson would have gone for either of those. <laughs> <laughs> so here's another way in which he wants it both ways. Um, in the sense that he's, uh, he says exactly what you're saying. So he says, you know, film, uh, film criticism is an almost reflexive activity like dre dreaming or breathing or crying. And a critic is no different from anyone else who stops to think about the experience of watching. So um, it's that kind of, you know, almost populist idea of, of criticism. And then the, the other side that he also wants to hold on to is that if you stop there, then you don't give thinking its due. Right? And so the argument against anti-intellectualism I took very seriously in this book, especially in this, culture, in this cultural moment. And I, 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 it, I come back to it. I think the idea that uh, turning that kind of activity like breathing into a reflexive activity that involves thought and that involves language that reflects thought is a form of criticism that I think he does celebrate and put out as a, as a, as a standard to aspire to, rather than always having it both ways. Yeah, I, I, well, I think we're just incredibly lucky to have him. I remember the days of Bosley Crowther, and you know, <laughs> but the, the Times critic has to be um, has a, has to be in 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 concert with his audience, with the mass audience, and I think he's just incredible. I think he mass he came to film from literary criticism, and he mastered film 
amazingly. I just think there's something, maybe if um, film critics are cinephilia is a kind of spectrum, a kind of Asperger spectrum. He's at the very normal end of the spectrum. You know? <laughs> I, don't think his, I don't think his sensibility was formed in relation to film. That's all. And that's just a, maybe a tiny thing missing somehow that, that we made him feel. But, um, do you think that that maybe weakens his contribution in any way, or do you think that that makes him I th- better suited? I th- well, I think he's absolutely perfectly suited to the New York Times. And I, and I, you know, I, I think he's, you know, he's more than just a marketing report. I mean, he's much, much, much more. I, I so we're starting with you, <laughs> because I know that you would have things to say. Uh, I've known him for, for two decades now. I, I first uh, wrote for him when he was one of these young upstart editors at Lingua Franca, uh, a, a, a satire of academic life, which was ideally suited for me since I thought I was living a satire of academic life. Um, and uh, he assigned me to, to review a three-volume study of the Frankfurt School and the student movement, uh, <laughs> published in, in German. That was the kind of stuff that, that, that Tony w- w- was interested in. He went on, as, as some of you know, to be a book critic at Newsday. He worked for Bob Silvers at the New York Fruit Review, and I encourage you so it was just passed, and on the N plus one website, there's a wonderful, moving, moving piece that he wrote, remembering Bob Silvers and what that was for him. That was graduate school for him. Tony studied literature at Johns Hopkins in the heyday of theory. Uh, and a couple years in, after studying the canon of Western literature and thinking that he might write a dissertation on mid-century American literature, he, he felt stifled. Uh, he wasn't willing to conform to the norms of academic life. And this is what Lingua Franca, I think, was probably also a good fit for him. Um, and he left that behind. Um, as for this, the book that I, you know, maybe it's because I, I'm so fond of, of Dear Tony, but, but, but I, I think the balance of seriousness and play uh, and I think that for, for Europeans especially, that, that, that critique of anti-intellectualism, that may make no sense, but why do you even need to do that? <laughs> Whereas here, it's so utterly necessary. Uh, and I ever, ever so often go back to Hofstetter's book on, on anti-intellectualism in American life. Um, as for the title, it's funny because we read this and we wonder, and, and we all kind of, especially for those of you who haven't even read the book, it, it's, a, it's a funny sounding title. I have to wonder whether it was his agent, Elise Cheney, whether it was his editor, Anne Gadoff, whether it was the Penguin Press. This is a title, some of you know Sarah Blakewell's work. You know, she's a best-selling book on Montaigne, and then later the, uh, the book on, on, on uh, the Existentialist Cafe and so forth. There was a book on how Jane Austen taught me, to, taught me to live and so forth. I wonder whether this, too, is playfully and whether this was done as a marketing strategy. I'm not sure, but I don't think we need to get too hung up on, on the title. What, for our purposes, and why I think Garrett and I wanted to invite Tony here is um, this is a book, though, as Johannes right, rightly points out, and, and as you two in your assignment, I'm sure, recognize, he doesn't discuss film terribly much over the 278 pages that you read, Stefan. Uh, and, and, uh, and yet, I think what he does say has a great deal uh, of value for what we've been discussing and debating over these two days. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll end it there. I don't have a question for the panel. I just wanted to kind of add my comment to the, to the group. Thank you. Maybe I'll add um, two points. One is going back to the initial discussion about the dialectics potentially of the book. Um, I mean, I guess mainly for Johannes, I would say the book reminded me actually a lot of Krakauer's history book insofar as every chapter takes two different positions um, and explores them and pushes them to their limit and pushes the concepts and you know, is interested in antinomies, so not dialectics that resolve. And it's, I mean, a bit like you were saying earlier uh, that Krakauer, that Kell was totally wrong about Krakauer, that he wasn't a Galian. He wasn't interested in final answers. He wasn't interested in dialectical syntheses. And this book, I think, has that quality as well, where it's always in the anteroom, um, which, you know, makes it probably necessarily unsatisfying for those looking for, you know, the final truth about beauty, pleasure, and truth, um, which the title might promise for marketing purposes or, or whatever. So that was one thing I wanted to say. The other, though, um, the pragmatism discussion I thought was very interesting. And, um, I wanted to go back to a comment that Stefan made yesterday morning in uh, this idea that the, the very powerlessness of the film critic is itself somehow liberating. And 
I guess there seems to be a certain tension because if on some level he's invoking you know American pragmatism and yet the book is so self-consciously useless itself insofar as it doesn't offer us any final answers. And it made me think, I wanted to just integrate into the discussion as long as we're talking about our own moment in media culture, um, the conclusion to the recent book by Thomas Elsasser on film history as media archaeology. And he makes a similar point actually about uselessness and his argument is partly that it's precisely that cinema is no longer the key medium of ideology anymore and that we're, you know, in the neoliberal age, um, ideology proceeds far more through social media, through our iPhones. Uh, cinema actually is very out of joint with our temporal rhythms nowadays and sitting, going to the cinema and sitting for two hours actually is starting to feel very unnatural as anyone teaching undergrads nowadays can attest. Um, and so I guess I'm curious to further pursue this issue of powerlessness and uselessness and whether there's indeed a liberatory quality to it and to what extent Scott might be entered into that discussion as well. I mean, you're probably referring to, to, to the, the beautiful uh, and economical uselessness of good art, right? I mean, this is like, uh, that's what I meant when I, when I said the power, powerlessness, or I would never say uselessness. I mean, of course, great re uh, reviews or great film criticism is not useless, as is uh, great art. It's never useless, but it's powerless only in the sense of, uh, of economical interference. Uh, and, and, you know, this, this is actually, uh, I think, for my taste, it's a, it's a good uh, development that um, film critics are not to blame anymore for, for, the, for the, you know, the, the, mm, the flop of a film, for example, because it's, it's clearly and evidently not, not the fault of the film critic anymore. Um, that's, that's, the only, that's the only powerlessness that I really detect. I mean, <clears throat> other than that, it's, a, it's the powerlessness of journalism or art criticism <clears throat> in, a, in a greater sense and not just film criticism. Right. There's still some filmmakers who'll say otherwise. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had a question, I guess, specifically for you, Stefan. Um, uh, the work that you've done on Ulmer over the years, like uh, 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 Man Off Screen, the documentary, appearing in that and writing all that work, do you have any uh, conception of how it was received in the States versus uh, in Europe? Because I feel like that's kind of a, a, a key thing to, to our... our uh, you know, America's relationship to this kind of text versus the European consumption of it. I mean, like, I've heard nothing but wonderful testimony about how Germans specifically have consumed you know, graciously and, and uh, voraciously over the years all this amazing theory and scholarship and criticism. But do you, I mean, do you, uh, could you speak a little about how your work on something like that, which is, you know, I mean, it's a wonderful subject to nerds like me, but it is kind of a niche subject in the grand scheme of arts criticism. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the American uh, um, reception of my book is, I think, an audience of one. It's, it's, it's he's sitting here. <laughs> 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 because my book never was translated into English, so and, and Noah speaks German so well that he he actually could read it. But of course, like uh, the documentary that Michael Palm made. Uh, it, Maybe I mean I think that was shown in America and the States at least in a in a very short, um, small uh, circle, um, and in the fest in a few festivals of course. Um, uh, was your question whether that reception uh, the reception of that film? I just meant more to talk about the the, the, necess the necessity of the anti intellectual argument in Tony's book versus something that you maybe would write for people used to reading your work. I didn't mean to gloss over the fact that the book the trailer, but uh, the you know, I found uh, Man Off Screen as part of a collection with other Ulmer work that I had to go looking for, you know what I mean? It was, it was the kind of thing that was sort of buried in Netflix back when that was primarily a DVD service. Uh -huh. So it was, it was something that I, I had to seek out, and I'm grateful that I found it, but that strikes me as, you know, if, if work like that done by passionate people, and it's got, you know, Joe Dante and John Landis, all these cult figures who do have their, their own audience, but I still doubt whether the, the entirety of their audience would have found and or responded to that work. Sorry, I just talked. Yeah, I, don't, <clears throat> I really don't know. I mean, Noah, do you know anything about how, how the reception went or, and how? Uh, yeah, and, and yeah. And it's a very small niche audience. I didn't even know that Netflix was was uh, yeah. distributed. So this is before they got the streaming platform. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it was a very very small audience. It wasn't yeah. TNT document. It was yeah. co-produced by by Turner. That's right. It, it's, uh, TCM, you mean? Turner TCM. Yeah. yeah, no, it did, they did, they did a, on, on Homer's uh, birthday or a centennial of his death, they, they did show it with 
uh, her sister secret after UCLA and then the preservation, after Chris Hall after that preservation of UCLA, and they included it. So those those uh, people who sought it out, I guess, could watch it, but I don't know of any wider exception. Mm -hmm. I can't remember whether Richard Brody did a piece on, on him, or I can't remember whether he in the New Yorker, but I can't remember whether he referred to the documentary. But in general, the work that you do like that is, is well received back home. Sure, I mean, if on a on a very low level, of course. I mean, there's like a, a figure like Edgar Ulmer is is such a niche figure and and such a he's he's well known to maybe among in in the German speaking language maybe in a few thousand people, you know, who actually are interested in in him. Of course, uh, more people know Mention am Sonntag, People on Sunday, and and uh, maybe the Black Cat films like that, but uh, they wouldn't know the name of the director. So um, of course, it's I think I mean and. This is the this is the condition under which you write such a book. You you know it's not a big hit. It will it will not sell thousands of copies, but you you do it anyway because it has to be out there and because it's a fascinating thing to to occupy yourself with. And you know that's that's why I do it. But yeah, there are, there are people who who notice it and 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 come and ask and interview me about what I, what I've written and what I've what I've researched. Uh, um, but this, yeah, it's a few people. Any other questions in the crowd? Have we out-questioned everyone? Oh, all the way in the back? All right. OK. Molly, can you tell some lively crowd stories? <laughs> 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 the National Society of Film Critics is really formed to counter. He had such no critic has ever had that much power. Scott has nothing like, isn't that true, Jim, don't you think? I mean, at the time, he could make yes. a film, but this film is different too then. Well, I think that it's whoever's in that. I mean, that may be true, but only because maybe more people read it. I mean, I think that, that Vincent Candy probably had as much as much power, but, you know, it was too good. I mean, well, in some ways. Yeah, <laughs> but I think the bosses, I hate to use this term, but middleware, I think states were very middleware, and it was a huge middleware. So that, therefore, I think there's something much more advanced, if not esoteric, about both Candy and um, Scott. Mm -hmm. But um, Scott knows how to how to catch in a way that it reaches the board. But I mean, they're not basically it's not a movie bus readership. But that I think is the key thing that yeah. didn't come up with. I mean, who are who are the readers? Have, yeah, who are yeah. we writing for? Who is he writing for? Yeah. Who are we writing for? That's, I think, the key thing. And maybe, i just throw this out as a possibility, that when Rick was talking about uh, a, cin a cinephile critic, is it possible, you know, a cinephile critic, are they writing for themselves? Are they writing for, you know, the people who are also, you know, knowledgeable group of people? I think that, and I, I, I think that that's something that comes up, you know, in, in, in Andrew Saracen's writing, in Paul McHale, and certainly in Manny Parker. Um, you know, who was Manny writing for? He wasn't making much money doing this, although he did, you know, was a regular critic for for 15 years or longer, uh, in the early 40s, in the 50s. Jim, who do you write for? Well, I, I so who do I write for? I meant when you when, when you I was write. writing for The Voice. Well, my pat answer used to be I was writing for myself as like a 17 year old. <laughs> I'm writing for my 17 year old self, and and of course, you know, I like was probably corrupted away from that innocence, but that was always. You know, I was my first reader always, and that, but that was a place where you could do it. That's that's really unusual. Any others? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Going once, yeah. going twice. Sorry. No. All right. Uh, maybe I can. That's all right. I want to thank our panelists real quick. Are we going around the hall?